Hey everyone, uh, I was having some conversations with students before we got started here and I, and I just want to start the recording and, and say some things again here. So as far as um, more dates for lab days done through Skype, um, I, I want to do more of these and in terms of how our schedule is breaking down, I think finals week is going to be an especially prime time for doing this, although I, I want to make some time available next week as well. I'm definitely planning on our usual lab day on Tuesday, um, which will be perfect timing for preparing for exam two and taking exam two. But I'm thinking finals week will be like the prime time for thinking about makeups. So because I, I'm not teaching as many classes, I think we just have Monday for class officially um, on the schedule from the school. Um, I'm thinking that'll be a great time to, that'll be the prime window for doing makeup exams for exam one and two, and I want to help you with that. Betsy, it looks like you've got uh, a message you're typing. How should we go about setting up sessions to go over the exam review before makeup? Um, there's going to be two options here. One is to just contact me like you normally would, and we can do phone calls and things of that nature. Here, let me get my video going again. Uh, whoop. Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to move this window slightly so I can access that button. Uh, oh, come on. Here we go. Um, so the two options here are going to be um, just contacting me like you normally would, giving me a phone call, um, and, and we talk. Uh, I'm happy to do the video thing if you want to do that as the way of having our phone call happen. Uh, we can make that happen. And then I'm going to be making announcements about when I'm going to do exactly what I'm doing right now, but at some other time, uh, and having a window open for people to just drop in and do some review with me that way. Um, so both both of those are going to be options. So you can definitely count on our Tuesday lab time at 1.30 to 3 o'clock next week. That's definitely going to happen. And I might be able to set up another one too next week. Um, it'll just be a matter of balancing the schedule. I think I think I might be able to have some child care support on an afternoon and then I can then I can make that happen. Any other any questions people have? Kevin looks like you're typing something in. Can you do one that's not at 1.30? Um, that, that's the time I've got set up for it that seemed to work for most people's schedules this quarter. If you, uh, so there, there are going to be ones that are not at 1.30, um, but uh, I would say if, if, those, if the, whatever official times I post for these things don't work for you, then we should just set up a phone call to do it. Um, I meet with student, I've been meeting with students outside of class constantly this quarter, and I'm still happy to do that now that we're switched to online only. It's just a matter of finding the time that works for both of us. Happy to do that. Okay, um, let, let's get rolling. Um, we got a, a little bit more to talk about with statistical applications with that second standard of evaluation. And then I'm going to pull an audible here. I was thinking about our schedule this week and, and what we can do uh, gearing up for exam two next week. And I thought with two class days, let's go for the really big one the big doozy in this unit that it takes more time to explain and I think will take us two full days. I didn't want to put it like straddled over the weekend or something goofy like that. So, and, and that, that argument form is inference the best explanation. So I know that that was listed in the schedule to come later when I, when I said here's the order of inductive arguments that we're going to pursue. Um, but I'm going to I'm calling this audible because I think it just makes more sense naturally for our schedule. We, we lost Monday so things didn't quite work out the way I've was initially planning because um, we just spent Monday talking all about the COVID-19 stuff uh, and what to do about our class. Um, but I, I think this will work the best for our schedule. So my plan is to talk about um, inference the best explanation today too. Today and tomorrow will be for IBE and I think we can knock it out. Okay, but this last bit about uh, um, statistical applications. Let me uh, share our, um, our uh, what do you call it? Um, virtual whiteboard here. We'll put up what we had up yesterday. Um, come on, computer. Mm. Oh, it's taking its sweet time. Here we go. 
All right. Uh, question, what chapters will test two be on? Test two is basically entirely a matter of two things. One, uh, formal logic, so the chapter six stuff, and then inductive reasoning, which is all this chapter eight, nine, and 10 stuff. Um, so that's, that's what we're dealing with for exam two. So it's deductive logic and inductive logic. That's the, that's what we're doing. Okay. So here we go with the whiteboard. Everyone can see it? Or, oh, it's still connecting. You can see it now? It's a little offset here. Let's fix that. Can people see that on their, on their screens? Cool. Awesome. All right. So uh, I feel like we're doing pretty good here with how the percentage is doing that first standard for evaluating statistical applications. Um, that one's pretty straightforward. The key is, especially in how you give your answers, that you just want to be um, demonstrating to me that you understand uh, that the getting that percentage close to 100% or 0%, the closer it is to that, the stronger the application is going to be. And the closer it is to 50-50, the weaker it is. But this second standard, this relevance of the reference class, is the reference class chosen in the argument the most relevant that's the one that's going to be a little trickier. That one's going to require more explanation because of how much the evaluation depends on the background assumptions that you have. So uh, again, this convention I'm going to be using for IBE today in today's lecture as well, everything in black would be what you're given in the actual problem. So if you if you got a problem that you're an application you're asked to evaluate on the exam, for instance, or in the homework. The, the argument offered will identify what the reference class is, what the subset is that'll be present in the English, and what the property in question is, and some indication of the ratio, whether that's with a number or some other informal phrase like almost all or next to none or something like that. Um, in order to evaluate the, reference, the relevance of the reference class, you can't just stick to the reference class that was chosen and that was talked about. You're going to have to use your own imagination to think about what other possible reference classes is the subset a member of, and would have the, would those have been better a better guide to whether or not the subset has the property in question? So that was the issue. So we were talking about an example yesterday of, you know, first day of class, you've got a new instructor, trying to figure out is this instructor the subset a good teacher? You know, is are they are they going to be a good person to take a class with? Is this class going to go well with them as the teacher? And there might be a whole number of things that you observe about that subset, property, other properties that that teacher has that puts them in a category with other instructors who have that same property. And you might think about your past experience here, about what percentage of teachers who were members of those reference classes, it ended up being a good experience. That's the property in question. So which one of those would have been the best one to get guidance about this? Um, I mentioned yesterday that this is uh, connected with like statistical cherry picking. Um, that uh, you, can, you can kind of, if you've got a, a conclusion that you're gunning for, that you're like maybe insincerely just attempting to rationalize, you can probably find a reference class where the numbers work out in your favor, right? Where that first standard is going to be met well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the application is a strong application. It's kind of like, what evidence do we, do we think is the most important to be guiding our decisions about that conclusion? Does it go one way or does it go the other? So that's the really key idea here with the, the second standard here about the relevance of the reference class. Um, and one that I, um, I want you to be sort of tracking, or be, to have... Um, to have your uh, awareness up about, that it's going to take some real creative thinking uh, and reflecting on what else you know about the world in order to figure that out, to figure out uh, how good is this reference class. Um, I find on the exam, just historically with teaching this class, that this one is really, really tricky. Um, so uh, oftentimes students aren't necessarily thinking about all the other options of what could have been used instead and they're just working with what is given in the problem and that's just not going to cut it in this situation. You can't just deconstruct the example that you're being given to analyze. You have to be thinking what else is not being talked about that maybe would have been better to talk about. 
So hopefully that's making some sense here. Uh, Jose said, so like 80% of BC instructors are great. So Tim being a BC instructor is likely to be great too. That would be a statistical application. And the question is, is being a member of the class of Bellevue College instructors the most relevant reference class that you could be going with? Um, maybe you, it'd be better to look at philosophy instructors at Bellevue College, something a little bit more specific. You can make those reference classes as complicated as you want them to be. Um, because maybe the more specific they are, the more relevant they are for evaluating the case at hand. Um, is that making sense to you, Jojo? Or, uh, sorry, Jose? I've got a Jojo at my last class. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, and I'm a, I'm a Jojo fan, too, so sorry about that. <laughs> a little Freudian slip. Um, okay, uh, here's, a, here's an example from the homework. that I'll spoil one of these. Um, oh, Raymond? <laughs> Unexpected Jojo. Raymond, did, did you have a question? No, oh, okay, okay. Um, Colton, you don't have some? Oh. <laughs> oh, a bunch of JoJo references. I love it, I love it. I'm old school JoJo, man. Um, it's so weird how it's... Okay, I'm not going to get a big tangent. Okay. So, um, here's a homework problem that I'm going to spoil. So it said, uh, one of the homework problems says something like, I might be getting this slightly wrong, but it, it's okay. We'll, we'll just run with this example. It'll work fine. Um, it says something like 90% um, of socialists with blue eyes uh, voted for McCain. Maureen is a socialist with blue eyes, so she voted for McCain. Something like that. And when we're looking at that reference class, part of it, or, or I think it was like, no, 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 I think I'm getting it wrong. Like 10% of socialists with blue eyes voted for McCain. Marine is a socialist with blue eyes, so Marine did not vote for McCain. I, it's probably something like that. And when we're looking at the relevance of that reference class, um, one part of it does seem to be very relevant to the property in question. Are you going to vote for a, a Republican conservative candidate like John McCain? This is from, you know, the book is a little dated here. Um, are you going to vote for a conservative candidate like that? Well, Socialists don't usually go for that. You know, that's not... Oop. It looks like someone muted me, uh, but I, I think I caught it uh, in time. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Um, so the part about the whether the person is a socialist or not does seem to be relevant to their voting habits. Um, especially given some background assumptions I got about socialists. Um, but the part about having blue eyes doesn't seem to be relevant. So a better reference class would just be, well, what do socialists do, right? What's the general trends about socialists? Leave out the blue eyes thing. That's not going to help. Maybe it, maybe it helps to get your statistics the way you want them to, but that's not actually going to count as more reason to think that Maureen actually didn't vote for McCain. So that, that's an example, of, that's a really easy one to do, um, but sometimes they can be more complicated, like um, for figuring out who people are going to vote for in an election, there could be a lot of variables that could be significant, um, and we want to pick the one that would be the most significant. So think about it backwards. If we're trying to figure out whether Maureen is going to vote for John McCain or not, um, which aspect of Maureen you know, positively or negatively is going to be the greatest indicator of that. And that requires a judgment of relevance. And you might think about things in different ways. You might all have different answers on the, the exam questions for this and evaluating it. But you need to identify to me what your background assumptions are that mediate your judgment of whether something is relevant or is not relevant uh, to the property in question. Whether the reference class is the most relevant or whether there's a better one out there. Um, if you think it's not the most relevant, then the easy way to explain your answer is to say what you think would be more relevant and why. And that why is going to be very important. So just to really beat a dead horse here. In anticipating setting yourself up for success with exam two, keep in mind uh, a couple things. One, when I'm grading, I'm going to be looking for excuses to give you points. 
not excuses to take points away from you. The way I grade is not you start with a 100% score and then I ding you for things. That's not how I grade. How I grade is you start with a score of zero and I want to give you credit and you need to give me the excuses to give you that credit. And the way you do that is by explaining your answers, especially in this, in, I mean, for the lo formal logic stuff, you, there's no explanation. But for the inductive logic part of this exam, it's all about the explanation. Your explanation needs to demonstrate you understand in principle what's going on with the particular measuring stick of one of these criteria that we're applying to a situation to figure out if it's strong or weak. Okay, so that's what you need to do. So the advice here is always to err on the side of giving me more. Um, even if you're worried about maybe saying the wrong thing, then to be more conservative in your answer and not give me as much to work with. If you don't give me much to work with, then I, I just won't have a basis for the excuse to give you credit. And I want to do that. Okay, so that's, that's how I'm approaching it. I feel like in the past, I, I've been giving this advice for years now. When I first started teaching the class, I definitely noticed that students would hold off on putting more of their thinking out there or what their background assumptions are because they were afraid of saying the wrong thing and getting dinged. Um, and I'm just telling you, that's not the game that's being played here. That strategy won't be effective. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about that? It, okay, makes sense, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I want to be completely transparent about the expectations for how I'm grading these things. And that's how I'm going to do it. It, the other advantage of this is that if you've got weird background assumptions, or at least weird as far as this person's concerned, like you don't share the same background assumptions as me, you look at things in a different way, you look at the world in a different way, um, if you really explain your answers, I can be like, yeah, they understand how statistical applications work, or they, they understand, the student understands what we're talking about when we're talking about the relevance of the reference class. And um, I don't just have to rely on, oh, well, you got the right answer, so I'm assuming that you've got the right background assumptions or the right way of doing this process. Um, you're, if I graded that way, your credit would actually be way more at risk if you think differently than I do. But by putting your explanations out there, I can see that even if you think differently than me, you still might be using this technique of analysis competently. That's the key. Okay, so let's let's transition. Oh, uh, any questions before we leave applications behind? Yeah, but can't an argument fallacy like Tim likes peaches because he's a teacher, 80% of teachers like peaches have multiple answers or responses? Um, I, I don't think this is actually a, uh, a statistical application. Uh, oh, oh, wait, 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 no, okay, I see what you're saying here. Okay, so reference class is people who like peaches or I'm sorry, teachers, we want to say 80% of teachers like peaches. Therefore, Tim, who is a teacher, also like likes peaches. Um, yeah, that'd be an application. The evaluation of that could have multiple answers or responses. That's correct. But what it, regardless of, of what different answers people give, it would be correct analysis if you're using the criteria for evaluating that argument properly. And that's the thing that I'm interested in. That's why your explanations are so crucial. Is that making sense, Jaden? I think we're on the same page here. But I, w I just want to confirm. Okay, okay, cool. You're welcome. So is the goal to narrow the scope to see if there's a better argument? Um, I, I think by better argument you mean a, a more relevant reference class of so just speaking to that particular criteria. Um, sometimes a more narrow 
um, scope of that reference class is going to make it more relevant, but sometimes it won't. Like in the example with socialists with blue eyes. That's more narrow than just socialists, but it's including an element that is not really relevant or we don't have any good background assumptions to justify thinking it's going to have some influence. Um, actually, you know, there's one other like big idea I'd want to present about this, about the way that we're trying to develop, sharpen our tools of statistical reasoning in this class. Uh, the way I, I was talking how if you're taking a stats class, you know, it'd be a bunch of math stuff going on too, and that's important. But um, there's a, um, sometimes you'll encounter this idea. It's kind of got a slogan. It's just about the numbers, stupid, this kind of thing. That who knows what's going on in the world. We don't want to uh, taint our reasoning with a bunch of pre-theoretical assumptions or background assumptions about what's going on in the world. Um, so we should just, just look at the numbers. If socialists with blue eyes is statistically significant, then that's what should guide our reasoning. And we're not going to presuppose what things count and which things don't count. This kind of approach, though, is just rationally impractical and implausible. There's always going to be some contextualization of the strength of the argument in terms of things that don't just have to do with the statistics. Figuring out what those proper background assumptions are may be the result of things like statistical generalizations and the kind of reasoning that we use there. But there's always the concerns about bias that happen with that too, and it's not just about the numbers when it comes to a good statistical generalization either. And uh, a unit we're going to talk about in a little bit about how we figure out what the patterns of reality work causally, the causal reasoning unit, um, also gives us some more resources for where to, how to hold our background assumptions critically accountable. Um, but the, the point is not, uh, when, when I'm saying you always have to use your background assumptions to make an evaluation of inductive reasoning, um, this isn't to say that background assumptions are to be handled dogmatically. Like we're going to assume that they are true and not be willing to reconsider them. Instead, it's recognizing how these things are logically dependent on each other. So how, depending on what my background assumptions are, I might take a different view of whether this is a strong bit of inductive reasoning or a weak one. And um, then if you and I disagree about it and we're able to articulate what our reasoning is and which background assumptions our evaluation is dependent on, we might be able to notice which background assumptions are we not on the same page about, and now let's have a debate about those things to then be able to sort out our disagreement over whether this is this particular argument is a strong or weak case of induction. So that, that kind of sensitivity is the payoff of um, getting trained in the kind of techniques that we're learning right now. Okay, um, I want to move on here uh, so we have plenty of time for inference of the best explanation for today and tomorrow to try to clean this all up. And the first thing I want to say about IBE or inference the best explanation is uh, a callback to something I mentioned earlier I think maybe last week or, or maybe earlier this week which is that inference the best explanation is a really crucial part of how science actually works and and how we just reason about the world but we're not always tracking it super explicitly so I, I mentioned that I thought a lot of the forms of argument that we're going to study in this unit might be familiar to you that you've got some intuitive contact with them they don't sound totally alien and this one, IBE, might sound a little more alien, or at least the kinds of standards that we're going to be discussing for how to evaluate them might not be not might not come as intuitively. It's not something you maybe have thought about explicitly before, but that doesn't mean you don't have contact with it. Inference, the best explanation, is something you're doing constantly. Um, part of our uh, I don't want to get too much into like. Kantian cognitive science or something like that, but um, this is a big deal for Kant when he's doing his philosophy of mind. But our minds are constantly looking to explain what we're experiencing. Every time an event happens, we're like, why did that happen? And we may not think about that explicitly because it's so familiar or we already have an explanation that we're comfortable with and so we don't rethink it. And maybe just, just you know, oh, yep, I know about that pattern. Don't ask any questions about it but we're still tracking it, even if we're not always consciously aware of it. Something happens, and you're like, why did that happen? The person said that to me, like, what were, why did they do that? We're actually using inference the best explanation when we are doing our analysis of conversational implication. You know, we're trying to speculate about what's going on inside someone's head based on their behavior. We're like, well, if these were their motives, or if this is what they were trying to do, then their behavior would make sense. 
And that kind of reasoning is what inference the best explanation is all about. I could, I could wax on here for quite a long time in giving you some examples in the scientific world of where, where scientists use inference the best explanation as a part of their theorizing. Um, and if you want to hear about that sometime or have an extended conversation, I'd love to do it. But for the purposes of efficient use of time here, I'll just indicate that in many cases, scientists are working with evidence not in the direct way that we might be familiar with with something like doing science fair projects or the scientific method where it's like I've got a hypothesis and then I'm going to do some experiments and make some observations that directly confirm or disconfirm my hypothesis that that kind of use of direct evidence inference the best explanation is a kind of indirect way of using evidence I observe that something has happened and then I'm like why why did it happen What's the explanation for why this happened instead of something else? And then if I find an explanation that is good, and we have to cash out what that means, then I will believe that the hypothesis that provides that explanatory work is true. So basically, inference of best explanation is saying, my reason for believing that something is true, some conclusion, is the fact that if it was true, it would be able to explain a lot of things that we want explained. So uh, every inference of best explanation has a conclusion, some hypothesis claim, and the defense of it has two components. One, the observations that we're attempting to explain, so the, the object of evaluation. And then two, a claim that sounds a little bit like this. The hypothesis explains the observations better than any other competing hypothesis. So if, if the observations are in fact true, and that second claim is true, that the hypothesis is the best explanation, that's my basis for having a reason to believe the hypothesis as a conclusion. That's how inference the best explanation works. Um, this is really big in the world of cognitive science. I might even use one cognitive science example here um, as a toy example for explaining other things about inference the best explanation. Um, but this is the argument pattern that, that we use. Now think about uh, how are we doing so far? Uh, any questions in chat? Just want to check in here before I go to the next thing. Did I did I lose anyone here or any any part you want me to go back to? I can't read the room uh, in this virtual space as, as easily as when we're in person, so I'm I'm reliant on you. Looks like we got some people typing. Here, while people are typing, I'm going to just set up some stuff on our whiteboard for what's next. I'll be listening to this a few times to let it sink in later. Okay, that's, that's totally fair. Oh, lost signal. So you're a little bit behind. Connection is stable now. Okay, so far. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Lost signal for a second. We'll just check YouTube lecture. Okay, okay. Huh. Connection was weird. It's good now? Okay, okay. If that ever happens, please just jump in right away and I can I can slow down. Oh, BC Wi-Fi. Ah, yeah. Ah, oh, BC Wi-Fi. What specific chapter are we going over right now? This is in chapter 10. Yeah. And, and if you want to be following along, um, lecture 5 is, um, is the one we're kind of covering, and inference of best explanation is toward the tail end of those lecture notes.
<laughs> okay, bunch of bunch of stuff about the BC Wi-Fi. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going here. So, if this is the form of of the reasoning of inference, the best explanation that we're citing something's explanatory usefulness as a reason for believing in it, this is not like the evidence is directly proving something. So here's here's a, a another example I'm gonna be playing around with. I'm, I'm gonna have a bunch of toy examples for discussing different aspects of inference, the best explanation. But here's a here's a good intuitive one. Let's say you're a detective on a crime scene. A murder happened, right? And you go to the crime scene and you have a bunch of evidence. You know, the crime scene is in some sort of state. There's, you know, maybe some chairs knocked over. There's some blood stains. There's, you know, some shell casings or whatever, right? You got all the different evidence, like what's going on with the body. Um, there's all these observations of the facts. And you're not confused about them. You're just directly seeing them. You're like, this, this is what I got. But if you're trying to reconstruct what happened, Maybe with the goal of figuring out, like, who killed this person? Maybe, like, who is the, who is the culprit, right? You're going to be using inference the best explanation to do this. You don't really have direct evidence. It's not something like eyewitness testimony or a, a cameras were recording the whole thing or something. That would be direct evidence. But something like, we've got these things that are clues, and we're trying to figure out, well, we'll put different speculative constructions on it. Well, if this was the person who did the crime, then that would explain why we're seeing this, that, or the other thing. Or if the person died this way, that's why we see this happening. Um, so that's an example of inference, the best explanation. Another kind of more intuitive, ordinary example or illustration of this would be going to the doctor. You go to the doctor, you're just sitting down, and you tell the doctor, look, I got these symptoms. What do you think? Do I have coronavirus? Maybe something like that, right? And they would they would uh, look at they would think about your your symptoms, and then maybe offer a diagnosis. You have this condition. If you had this condition, that would make sense as a way of explaining the symptoms that you have. So that would also be a case of inference, the best explanation. But in all of these cases, they're somewhat you know we say speculative, right? And they're fallible. They're definitely fallible, like all inductive argumentation. But to test it, to put the screws to a particular hypothesis and say, is this really what we are, what we should rationally believe is happening? Um, <clears throat> we'd have to think about what are the competing hypotheses, and they do they do better explanatory work than something else. Here's another. I'm going to take a, a little side tangent here. Talk about a, another subject that's near and dear to my heart: global warming or other kinds of aspects of climate change. There's a question: What is responsible for it? Is it the result of human action? Is it anthropogenic? Um, or is it some other explanation? And there are people who are skeptics about human-caused climate change. And they have other hypotheses to explain what's going on. But to rationally evaluate that, you'd need to think about, uh, are those hypotheses more plausible as explanations than the one that pretty much all the scientific community is is telling us, right? Looking at all of the observations, all the evidence of the facts that are involved in the situation, which hypothesis does the best job of capturing all of those observations and explaining them. And figuring out what's the best explanation is got some ambiguities to it, but there's also a lot of standards here that we can explicitly identify um, that can be used as a criteria. It's not just a crapshoot of like what your gut tells you of like, yep, this is more plausible to me than this, right? There's some really bad um, objections that are offered against human caused climate change, um, especially the ones that sort of see it as part of some vast global conspiracy on the part of liberal scientists or something. I mean, that explanation for the scientific results we're getting, basically the hypothesis is that the scientists are all fabricating their data to be able to make a political point, is not a very good inference of the best explanation. That explanation is not very plausible for a lot of the reasons we're going to talk about with the criteria to follow here. Um, but, but the main thing here is about having to, trying to have some more rigorous and explicit criteria for being able to evaluate the rationality of an attempt to explain things. There are so many things that we can't get direct evidence for, but we still want to gain knowledge of. And we can use evidence in indirect ways to do that. That's what IBE is for. It's for exactly those kinds of cases where we can't see everything directly. Okay? Where direct evidence is maybe not available to us. Um, <clears throat> now, to actually evaluate 
any given inference the best explanation would take a ton of work for and you can already see this based on just the stuff I've talked about so far in the lecture um, you'd have to look at what are all the hypotheses and then sort of grade them using a criteria and compare them against each other and figure out which one's got the most support and then you could say yes this is a good inference the best explanation or no it's a weaker one it's a weak one because there are better explanations than the one that's being offered right here we don't have the time to do that you don't have the time to do that on an exam um, I'm very familiar with this space of reasoning because of my work in cognitive science and almost all of cognitive science is inference the best explanation because we don't have direct evidence for most of what goes on up in here <laughs> with our brains or the mind itself um, so we're, we're running a lot of inference the best explanations and in the field of cognitive science one inference the best explanation argument and evaluating it can take up an entire book because of how much burden of proof for making these judgments is required so that's not something you're gonna be asked to do um, so don't don't panic about that the, the only thing we're gonna the where we're gonna set our ambitions for this class is in understanding what are the variables that would make an explanation better or worse so we're not going to be evaluating a full inference the best explanation by doing this comparatively between hypotheses we're just going to take one hypothesis and get straight on what could make it stronger or weaker as an explanation so not so much about the strength of the support relation but what kind of training would you need to be able to do one of those bigger more ambitious projects so we're kinda of giving you the tools um, and we're not necessarily gonna go for the whole full robust version of it is that making sense to everyone in chat what I just said this is kind of an important important idea we're just gonna be focusing on the standards for what makes for a better or worse explanation is that feeling all right? Maybe while you're typing, I'm going to do something. Um, so I had students who were, I was looking at the Google Analytics on my videos this week, and uh, not so much in this class, but in my other two classes, students were um, not watching the whole video, and I noticed that the spikes happened right where I had the code words. So I'm not going to, um, that, that was a problem. People were not just, they were not watching the videos sin sincerely. So a student in my last class where it was really bad um, recommended that instead of doing it verbally, because the transcript, the automatic transcript can give you that information, but maybe we'll do it visually. Uh, so uh, because of the conversation we ended up having in my political philosophy class, this was the code word. So you can see that here. Here's, here's how it's going to, we're going to do this visually in, instead of auditorially. Uh, as a way of dealing with that problem a little bit. Those of you watching this on YouTube later, it's uh, mirrored, but I think you can figure out uh, what those words are and what's happening here. Um, but there you go. That's what you'll input um, into uh, that. Yeah, and I actually probably shouldn't have said that word um, because then it is going to show up in the transcript. Dang it. But there you go. Here's, here's this important for the lecture today. Okay, so here's some questions. On the exam... We will be judging each hypothesis, and we will also have to write what we can do to improve them. So actually, I'm only going to give you one problem on the exam for this. So I'm going to give you one scenario and an explanation being offered for it. All you have to do is run that explanation through the gauntlet of criteria for what makes for a better explanation and say, like, is it doing good or is it doing badly on this criteria, on this criteria, on this criteria, on this criteria, doing all of them. Um, Raymond asks, so... Do we evaluate inference the best explanation by looking at support relation of multiple hypotheses? Yes, if you're doing a full evaluation of inference the best explanation. But I'm not going to be requiring that because that's tons of work. You'd have to write a whole paper to, to probably do this. And I'm, I'm not going to have you do that. So we're just going to focus on one explanation and figure out how good of an explanation is it. Okay, um, any other questions? Oh, I, I have one question here. Um, is anyone um, just listening right now to the lecture and not able to watch it? Like not seeing the visuals? Anyone in that boat? 
No, no, no I, I just mean because some people might be like listening on the phone, or, and that's how they're connected. They're not seeing the video. Um, I know that the video is working technically, but is anyone not watching the video? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. All right, I'm just going to tell you the code word then, um, auditorially, so that you have it. Um, so the code word for today is Mickey Mouse. That came up in a conversation in my political philosophy class, so code word's Mickey Mouse. Okay, so I'm sharing with you um, the whiteboard again, um, and here's what, uh, ex this is basically the moving parts of an explanation. This is it. It's only got two pieces, um, and... Uh, and they're in a explanatory relationship. So this is not a support relation here. This is an explanatory relationship. Um, you've got what I'm going to call the stuff to be explained. These are, uh, actually we could also put in here, these are the observations. So this is, th this is like the, the symptoms in the doctor case or like the, the clues in the detective case. We know that there's some stuff happening and we want an explanation for it. The fancy word that you can say at dinner parties to refer to this is explanandum. And it's really fun to say, but it's kind of obnoxious as an esoteric word, so I'm not going to use it. I'll just talk about the stuff to be explained. But try saying explanandum sometime. It's really fun. Uh, and then you've got the hypothesis, which is trying to explain the stuff to be explained. It's telling a story about why this stuff happened. And we refer to that as the explanons. So you've got the explanandum and the explanons. Don't worry about that terminology. It's not going to be on the exam. Um, we'll just talk about stuff to be explained and the hypothesis that is supposed to explain it. Um, and that's what we get. That's inference to the best explanation. Uh, it, we're, that, that is an explanation that might be part of an inference to the best explanation. We're going to cite the hypothesis ability to explain the stuff to be explained as a reason for thinking that it's true. Now, how about the standards? The standards, um, <laughs> your word processor doesn't even recognize explanandum as a word. Ha! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about the standards for how do we figure out if an explanation is a good one or a bad one. And the first one the book calls, um, does the hypothesis really explain the stuff to be explained? But this is not so helpful as a, a word, so I'm just going to call it story to tell. Because the main question is just, is the hypothesis even trying to explain this stuff to be explained? Now, first major point of emphasis about this is that if there's only one thing to be explained and they're offering any hypothesis, then the hypothesis does have a story to tell about the stuff to be explained. So with only one thing in this category here, um, any explanation is going to trivially pass this first test. But what's really the concern here of, um, of story to tell is maybe there are multiple things that need explanation in this stuff to be explained. So let's say you go to the doctor and you have multiple symptoms. Well, a better explanation would be an explanation that handles all of the symptoms. It has a story to tell about all of those symptoms instead of just some of them or maybe just one of them. Um, so you only need to think about this criteria as really being relevant in a scenario where the stuff to be explained has multiple elements to it that each require their own story. And then the question is, does this hypothesis have a story? Just try, Is it even trying for all the stuff to be explained? That's the first standard. Um, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay. I'm going to be drawing these little arrows um, because while the basic idea of an explanation is really simple, like everything in black is just what you would get in the problem that you're analyzing, um, everything in red is going to be stuff you have to be sort of tracking or thinking about. And um, there's a lot of different facets to this. And so I want to be sort of uh, putting these indicators of this criteria is about this piece of the whole puzzle. I, th I think this diagram is going to be very, very helpful in keeping track of all the standards for good explanations because there's seven of them. There's a lot. Um, and some of them are easy to mix up with each other.
Okay, let's talk about the second standard then, and that's depth. And the question about depth is whether there's sort of a gap in this explanatory story. Um, depth is like, um, does the hypothesis, is the hypothesis giving sufficient information for being able to explain this stuff to be explained? Here, here's the little phrase I use, um, and, and actually I might, uh, you can see that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing this so you can look at me. I want to use gestures <laughs> with my face here. Depth, depth is a little tricky. So here's um, here's the phrase, the sort of technical phrase for how to evaluate depth and what depth is getting at. And then I'll unpack that a little bit. And maybe that's where we close off for today's lecture. So depth is wondering, the standard of depth is wondering, does the hypothesis stand in need of more explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. So when I said a second ago that the question is, is the hypothesis sufficient to be able to explain the stuff to be explained? We're kind of wondering, is it incomplete as an explanation? Is there more explanation that's needed in order to see how it counts as an explanation? And so that, that phrase is a little tricky to maybe, you know, hear and be like, oh, okay, I got the idea here. Let me give you an illustration of this. So this, is, this actually happened to me uh, years back. Um, during fall quarter, it was coming back after Thanksgiving break, and um, I walked in with a cane and a limp, and my critical reasoning students were like, dude, Tim, why do you got a limp? So there's an observation. I'm walking with a limp. I got the cane, and my students want an explanation for it. So I offered a hypothesis to them. Oh, I had too much fun last night. That was my explanation at Thanksgiving. You know, I had too much fun last night. That's why I got a limp. And that's not a very deep explanation. Because you might be like, okay, that's part of a story of, of how you got a limp. But I, it's not making sense. Like, why would having too much fun mean limp? Right? Imagine um, we're talking on the phone. And we're like, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I got a limp. And you're like, oh, so you had too much fun last night, huh? I mean, that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't immediately think of that as like limp always means something like had too much fun. Having too much fun might be part of the story, but we need more explanation in order to see how that counts as an explanation for why I have a limp. Um, so that that's one example here of uh, an explanation that's not very deep. It maybe goes part of the way, but there's kind of like a gap between the hypothesis being true and it making sense of the stuff to be explained, why that happened. Here's another example. This one's taken from the homework. Um, even though we normally have class at this time in this room, um, I don't see anyone in the classroom because a wicked witch made them all invisible. So the hypothesis here is a wicked witch made everyone in the class invisible, and that's the explanation offered for the stuff to be explained, why I don't see anyone in the classroom even though we normally have class at this time in this room. Now that explanation has a lot of problems with it, but depth is not one of those problems. This is a perfectly deep explanation. Because if a Wicked Witch made everyone invisible, would you expect that you wouldn't be able to see them? Yeah, right? That's kind of what invisible means. <laughs> you can't see it. There's no questions how turning people invisible would explain why you can't see something. Now, I, I did say there's going to be other problems with that explanation. The Wicked Witch explanation is not rational for other reasons, for other criteria. But it's not because of a depth issue. Okay? So the, the practical technique that you can use to figure out if an explanation is deep or not is to assume the hypothesis is true, like kind of granting it for the sake of argument. Okay, let's say a Wicked Witch did turn everyone invisible. Would I automatically expect that the stuff to be explained would happen? So if a Wicked Witch made everyone invisible, would I automatically expect I wouldn't be able to see them? Yeah, okay, so it's deep. Story checks out. Right? Sufficient explanation is being offered for the stuff to be explained. Going back to my limp example, let's assume I did have too much fun last night. Would that automatically mean that I would have a limp? No. So the explanation is not deep. It's sort of incomplete. It's insufficient. So that's what's going on there. In case you're curious, what happened uh, at Thanksgiving, I was over at my in-laws house, 
and we were playing football in the backyard, and it was getting dark, and we probably should have stopped playing, but I was having too much fun, and so I went for one more pass and jumped over a rock and landed in a divot and rolled my ankle terribly. It was one of the worst rolled ankles I've ever had. Um, I don't know if I tore anything or something, but that was how, you know, I did have too much fun, and that was part of the story about why I got the limp, but it, it what really was needed here was I jumped over a rock and put my foot in a divot and rolled my ankle. That's why I've got the limp, right? Um, Josie says, uh, I did make the catch. Yes, I did. Um, Josie said, if you said the witch was here, then it was a depth problem? I, I don't understand. Uh, okay, so I don't see anyone in the classroom, um, even though we normally have class at this time in this room. Why? Well, because um, a witch was here. Yeah, that would be that would have a depth problem because just knowing someone is a witch doesn't mean I'm not going to be able to see people. That's correct. Yeah, David says worth it then. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't competitive, but anyway, um, we're we're out of time here for today's class. Um, if if anyone wants to stick around and ask some more questions here about inference the best explanation. Um, about the story to tell standard or the depth standard, let me know. Um, but we'll pick up here tomorrow and talk about the other five standards for what makes for a good explanation. You're welcome. Uh, could I pull up the whiteboard? Yes, absolutely. Yes. The code word I already offered, um, and it's in there. Uh, you missed it. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it again. The code word was Mickey Mouse. Hope you have a good day too, David. I will, I'll be sticking around here for a little while, so if people have questions and stuff, just drop them in. I, I'll probably stop the video here, um, but I'm still here.